Hello, uh, welcome to this session on Tools for Decision Making with Joey Savoy. Following a 10 minute talk by Joey, we'll move on to a live Q&A session where he will respond to your questions. He'll be answering questions on decision making, but Joey is also happy to answer any questions you have about charity entrepreneurship. You can submit questions in your name or anonymously using the box to the right hand side of this video. You can also vote for your favorite questions to push them higher up the queue, and we'll try to get through as many as we can. Then, after 30 minutes of questions, I'll bring the Q&A to an end. But that's not the end of the session. To help you think through and apply the ideas you've heard, I'll be asking you to join a 20-minute icebreaker session, where you'll have two speed meetings with other attendees to discuss your thoughts on the content. I'll explain how to do that when we get there. But now, I'd like to introduce our speaker for this session. Joey Savoy is the co-founder and director of strategy at Charity Entrepreneurship. Prior to that, Joey co-founded Charity Science, a meta-organization that increased the amount of counterfactual funding going to high-impact charities. Subsequently, he co-founded Charity Science Health, a GiveWell incubated nonprofit that increases vaccination rates in India using mobile phones and behavioral nudges. Here's Joey. We're talking about decision making. Now, the first thing I want you to do is think about the best decision you ever made. The outcomes, the success, the benefits, the trickiness of making that decision. And then I want you to think about the worst decision you ever made. The outcomes of that, the failure, sadness, the ramifications. It seems almost self-evident to say that decision-making is important. Most jobs in the world require a high level of decision-making, particularly important jobs like managerial jobs, charity founding jobs, research jobs. Uh, the difference between a good and a bad decision-maker can be organizational failure and collapse, or organizational success and scale. It could be the difference between doing a research project that defines a generation and doing a research project that's completely useless. Decision-making is highly important in almost every walk of life, and your big decisions can impact your life hugely. So, of course, that brings us to the big question. What do we need to know to make good decisions? This is a pretty challenging question for anyone to cover, not to mention in a 10-minute talk. So let's analogize it to a simpler question, an easier question. What tool was used to make this train? This train's entirely made out of wood, uh, took months to make, and uh, is a very complex piece of work. Well, of course, the answer was no single tool. You need an entire workshop of tools, as well as years of experience and knowledge about how to use them to even get close to a project of that level of intricacy and complexity. Likewise, going back to our decision making, you need many different decision making tools, many different decision making heuristics, many different decision making approaches to become a truly fantastic decision maker. Now, some decision making tools will be right at the top of your mind. If I tell you to think of a tool, you probably thought of a hammer. Um, and that's because it's a common tool. A lot of people have used it before. There's going to be key decision making strategies that you're going to use as well, key decision making systems that you tend to go to, tend to default to. And those are good, those are fantastic. It's nice to have a hammer at the ready, uh, but you need lots of different tools to make really strong decisions, just like you need lots of different tools to make a master wood work of wood. Now, there's a big difference between having used a hammer and being a hammer expert. Virtually everyone watching this talk is gonna have used a hammer at one point or another, um, but there's many different sorts of hammers, many different types of hammers. Hammers with specialized jobs, hammer with specialized purposes. Um, and it'd be very hard to become a true master of just hammers, even from reading. Even if you read a full book on the uses of each one of these hammers, they wouldn't be that helpful without the years of practice that comes with true mastery. Um, some decision techniques will be like hammers. You will have used them before, you'll be familiar, um, but there'll be a lot of room for mastery. Others will be learning completely new tools, things you might have never heard of. Just to emphasize the point of how few hammers you know, one of these is actually a rabbit plane, which isn't for hammering at all, but can confirm that you know even less about hammers than you might have thought you did. Now, another analogy that I find very helpful is the idea of a mental table. 
because we all have this. We all have a, a certain cognitive ability to lay out different things on the table to, to eventually put together mental constructs and make decisions. Um, and unfortunately, there's some bad news. As we get older, our mental table shrinks. Our raw processing power and speed uh, is at its peak in our early 20s. And from there on, it slows down. It's almost as though someone comes into your wood shop and cuts a little sliver off your working table every year. However, you also keep learning and getting better tools, getting better heuristics, getting better models, which means that your tool shed all around that table is growing bigger and more advanced and more sophisticated. Myself, five years ago, was probably a faster thinker, probably had more raw table space, could think about more things simultaneously and hold them all in my head at the same time. But my current version can outperform past Joey at everything, uh, every decision, every task, and it's because I've acquired tools and experience that I can now use to these problems to get a lot further. It doesn't matter how good or how much table space uh, a woodsmith has if all he has is a hammer. And the learning really doesn't stop uh, when you're in your 20s. Uh, if you're a good learner and really want to improve your mental toolkit and mental toolbox, you'll keep learning indefinitely and you might make the best, most informed, wisest decisions when you're quite well into your age. So what is a decision-making tool or a decision-making heuristic? Well, heuristics have a bit of a bad rap in some circles. Uh, they're a shortcut that can be used for problem solving or decision making that's a practical but not perfect method. Um, they can be a rule of thumb or an educated guess. Now, heuristics, uh, people rightly point at them as to leading to wrong conclusions, sometimes predictably so, leading to wrong conclusions. But they're also the bread and butter of decision making. A lot of the world is messy and doesn't give you perfect answers or perfect solutions. You have to have a series of heuristics that form together to form a tool which can point you in the right direction. Now, when it comes to both tools and heuristics, there's two different ways of thinking about them. One is in an additive way and one is in a multiplicative way. Now, if you have five really good decision-making tools and you add five more, if it was additive, you'd make decisions that are twice as good, which is very significant given the importance of decision-making. Being twice as good at decision-making is really, really valuable. But if it's multiplicative, then it would be more like 25 times better at decision-making than you would be with your original five tools. And I think decision-making is very much like this. Uh, heuristics and tools build off each other and complement each other, filling in each other's weaknesses. So there's a lot of benefits to having more tools in your toolbox. A set of heuristics becomes a tool. You can call an entire cluster a decision-making tool or, or you can call an entire cluster a decision-making tool that's made up of many different heuristics. Most likely you personally rely on a few heuristics and a few tools, uh, as does your immediate community. The effective altruism community has its own specific tools and heuristics that it tends to use. When all you have is a hammer, everything does look like a nail but expanding your toolbox can be very much worth the effort. Let's talk about some examples of tools. There's the tool of rationality. Much like the hammer, many people use some form of this in their lives, uh, but they're far from masters of it. And a hammer can be misused to destroy something just as easily as it can be used to create something. Science is a different tool that works in a different way. It's like a screwdriver. You can use it to take things apart and understand them at a deeper level. You might use budgeting and financial planning tools to realize what part of your project you don't need to work on, what things you can cut, each tool has a place and most examples benefit from many tools. Not every craft requires every tool, but most benefit from more than one. Now let's talk about an example of single tool decision-making versus multi-tool decision-making. So say you're contemplating a new project arm for your organization. You're thinking whether you should add this project to an already established and successful work. A one tool solution might be consulting with three of your smartest friends and aggregating their views. Now, that's not bad. That does get you some good information and pulls out some external biases, and there are some advantages of this process. However, it's very much a single methodology. And if that methodology is flawed, you're very reliant on that to come to a good decision. So let's look at the same thing from a multi-tool decision-making process. Maybe you do a literature review and see if other people have done this sort of project in the past. Maybe you consider in the abstract whether your organization has the resources to work on this new project. Maybe you look at the effect of altruism movement and take the idea of counterfactuals. What might have happened otherwise if you didn't start the project in the space? Maybe someone just as good as you would have started the project a year later. You maybe map out a theory of change to determine what the weakest elements of the model is. What's the likely effectiveness of the model of the new project that you're considering relative to the projects you're currently putting resources in. You might talk to experts, but not just your closest friends or the experts you always talk to. Try speaking to five experts outside of your peer group who have done similar projects in the past. 
And finally, you might even set up a small scale experiment with quick feedback to see if the project has traction in the real world, regardless of what your theoretical decision making models suggest. Now, this multi-tool approach is very valuable for a whole bunch of reasons. Um, you can use one methodology, but it's so susceptible to mistakes that you really will be led astray often. Uh, no single methodology is going to be great in all situations, and if you're too comfortable with a single tool, you'll rely on it too heavily. Using multiple tools will often get you a much better outcome. It will allow you to kind of pull out the signal from the noise. In general, what you're looking for is a convergence of perspectives. If something looks good from a bunch of really desperate angles, really different angles and perspectives, uh, that's a sign that it's not just a fluke. It didn't just air out and look really good on one methodology. It might be really suggestive that this is a promising thing to do. You want to avoid fake convergences. So convergences of methodologies is great where they all point to the same thing being promising. Uh, but a fake convergence might be something that feels like it's a bunch of different perspectives, but really isn't. So if we go back to the, the three smartest friends example, uh, your friends probably all broadly look at the same information, have the same worldviews, have the same mental models. You're not really getting a convergence, of, I mean, you are getting a convergence of opinions between the three of them, but it's not a convergence of different methodologies or distinctive viewpoints. And that's more what you're looking for with a multi-tool solution. So let's talk briefly about how to get more tools. How do you kind of build up this workshop so that you make excellent decisions? Well, there's a bunch of different ways. One of them is to learn about them. Uh, this is far from the last step. Learning about a tool doesn't give you enough, but it is a good start. Uh, the Charity Entrepreneurship Program teaches tools and many books focus very heavily on using a single tool or methodology to get better at decision making in that domain. You want to apply multiple tools as often as you can. Uh, try to break the habit of just using the simplest tool or the easiest tool and try to get into the habit of looking at something from a bunch of different perspectives and thinking how it might fare using different methodologies. You want to track the results of different methodologies. Some tools work more consistently than others. Some tools are more helpful than others. And uh, you might be very good at using some tools and quite bad at using other tools. It's very hard to get a sense of all this if you don't track the results of your decision making. Spending time around good decision makers, especially good decision makers with very divergent perspectives and tool uses than you can be very valuable. Being transparent about the tools that you use and getting feedback about that can also help a lot. Even being specific about the weights you give them. Maybe you have three different perspectives and you give the most weight to perspective one. State that out so that people can learn and criticize your methodology and you can learn what, where your mistakes are coming from. Sometimes it's not that you're not using enough tools, sometimes it's that you're weighting them incorrectly. You can try to think actively about many possible solutions whenever you bump into a problem, and often you'll bump into using different methodologies and different tools. And finally, really try to sharpen your tools in areas with quick feedback loops and high false availability. If you know that a tool is working well on small projects, then you can start to move towards a big project. Don't start by trying to build your masterpiece. Don't start by trying to build something as complex as that train. Start by working on a circle or a wooden duck or something very simple like that and seeing if you're getting the hang of the tools, how to use them in a low, quick environmental feedback way. So some of the most successful projects are determined by their key decision makers and the decisions that those people make. This, the point of this, presentation is to convince people that a multi-tool decision method is really worth considering and it's worth building up your tools that you use when making decisions if you want to make highly accurate decisions. And it's that decision making is a skill that you can get better at. It's not something linear or set at birth. You really can improve your decision making by active thinking about it and active effort working on different approaches. Um, and that it's really important and really worth doing. It's valued at key jobs, it's valued in key life decisions, even outside of the workplace. And probably one of the most impactful things you can do is improve your decision making. Thanks, Joey. That was a great talk. Uh, I felt you really hammered home your key messages there. <laughs> um, and I do apologize if you've had some video issues with me earlier, but we think we fixed it now. Um, so I see we've had a, a number of questions submitted already. Um, but I want to start off with the question that Joey posed at the start of his talk. So Joey, what is your best decision and your worst decision? And what did you learn from that? Yeah, so they're both somewhat related. Uh, I would say my best decision was taking a bit more of a risk than I was comfortable with and, and going with charity entrepreneurship, starting something out. There was definitely a lot of uncertainty in the early days of whether that would be successful or a highly impactful thing to do. Uh, and it turned out to be a really good decision. And on the opposite side, actually, it's kind of the opposite thing. Uh, there was an opportunity where I could take a big risk, uh, but decided not to because it was a little bit too 
I don't know, uh, frightening or intimidating at that point in my life. And I think I could have had a lot more impact, kind of had sped up my career a couple of years if I was willing to take that risk earlier. So uh, I wouldn't say that this, the, the kind of take home lesson from this is just be super risk taking. Uh, but I would certainly say that one of the things that it has made me keep in mind is that my tendency might be not to take the appropriate amount of risk compared to just doing the most good. Fantastic. So I'd, I'm going to move on to the first question then from, from Finjay. So is there robust evidence that people can be taught decision making skills in a way that works and lasts? Yeah, it's a, it's a really good question. There's some evidence on decision making techniques that are better or worse. Uh, so that lead to more consistent, reliable outcomes, both in kind of meta science fields and, and more generalized fields. But in terms of the teaching methodologies, it's, it's much more scarce. So CIFAR did run a study on this where they tried to teach some rationality and measured some outcomes, but it's pretty uh, neglected as an area in terms of how much study there is. So you can test uh, how good maybe someone is at making decisions, what heuristics might be particularly good, but there hasn't been at least robust evidence that I've seen uh, in terms of how to systematically teach it. Okay, and do you think there are any common intellectual tools that people still advocate for, say in like business or self-development or academic, that have actually been proven not to work? Yeah, <laughs> there, there's a lot of tools that have been proven not to work. I mean, you can take any part of the process. So say you're taking interviewing as an example. A lot of people go with their gut. A lot of people weight uh, a verbal interview really highly. There's lots of robust evidence showing that this uh, doesn't work super well. I think in general, people tend to pick uh, one heuristic set kind of using like hedgehog thinking, one really specific model, and tend to ride that way heavier than they would if they were, say, using a, a more diverse set. So that's a consistent negative trend, I would say. Yeah, and do you have any recommendations for like what works instead? So of course, the biggest one is to, to look at multiple tools, but I think the more meta technique you wanna look at is try to track your own successes and failures. Uh, so is there certain methodologies that you use consistently or that you tend to go to that don't work uh, or certain methodologies that you do find to work very consistently? So I remember I once had a friend who I would debate with frequently and he just would win every debate, even though he's a crappy debater. And it's because his kind of uh, meta methodologies were a lot better. He had a lot stronger understanding of statistics, a lot stronger understanding of the scientific method. And when I improved those skills, I noticed that even in those conversations, they just went a lot better. So I think uh, looking at the outcomes of decisions, especially objectively evaluated. So if you can get an external evaluator who you trust uh, to give you a sense of what decisions seem to go well, which ones didn't, and then replicating that methodology across other decisions. Fantastic. So do you ever find you're in a situation where you're kind of in paralysis when you've got different tools pointing to different options? What should you do in that situation? Yeah, one of my favorite uh, kind of heuristics that I like talking about is uh, time bounding your decisions. So obviously any decision that you're making could take kind of an infinite period of time. Uh, most things are kind of incredibly complex. Uh, on the flip side, you don't want to spend an infinite amount of time deciding whether to put butter or peanut butter on your piece of bread in the morning. So you kind of want to uh, dedicate some time depending on the importance of the decision and then stay within those time bounds and try to make the best decision that you can at the end of that time bound. Now, in some cases, this might be really hard because you'll have different competing heuristics pointing different ways and, and you won't really know. Uh, but in a lot of cases, once you've kind of set that time bound, you, you can at least know that you are confident that you're making this best decision uh, given the importance of the decision and how much time you pre-allocated to it. Yeah, that's really great advice. Um, so the next question is, how might we augment human decision making abilities with AI? Yeah, so pretty tricky question. I'm not an expert in AI. I will say that there is some evidence that certain algorithmic way of making decisions uh, works better in some situations, especially places where humans tend to be biased. Uh, but in other cases, AI's, uh, AI and algorithmic decision making is not very good. Uh, often, like what I was talking about with uh, weaknesses in the kind of business or for-profit world, uh, AIs tend to maximize really well a narrow set of things. So if you're uh, kind of setting up something to, to be that way, you want to augment it with something that's a bit broader. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And so Francesca asks, and um, how do you teach this, for example, to children? How do we make this kind of part of the curriculum or encourage people to adopt these kind of multi-tool techniques from an early age? Yeah, so I don't think uh, teaching children is uh, vastly different from teaching adults uh, when it comes to this sort of thing. Uh, practice really helps, especially if you go through and model specific decisions and say, okay, let's think of this kind of from this perspective, then let's think of it from this perspective. Obviously, knowing multiple perspectives, so being familiar with rationality, being familiar with science, this sort of thing really helps. 
Uh, and another way is just modeling uh, good decision making. So one of the things I've noticed consistently with really good decision makers is they try to talk to other really good decision makers a lot of the time and get a really good sense of how those people are thinking, what their process is, kind of fleshing it out in a transparent way and then improving off of that. So obviously, uh, if you're working on smaller scale decisions, uh, you'll be kind of uh, replicating some of these in, in much more minor ways, you know, maybe oh, you're thinking that you want to do this activity. Maybe you want to try thinking about it from this angle or that angle. I think in general, just encouraging some divergent thinking, encouraging coming up with a couple options before sticking on one is probably the first earliest thing you can teach. And then you can start to refine those into uh, more evidence-based models, uh, you know, scientific models, rationality models. And if, if you were going to recommend kind of three tools in particular that people should try and learn, are there any particular ones that stand out? Yeah, well, that's tricky. I mean, it all depends on what community we're in. So as we're mostly in the EA community, you know, people who are here, I would say the EA tools are probably going to be pretty salient. They're probably going to come to mind pretty quickly. That's going to be the, the, the hammer, metaphorically. You're going to be able to reach for that really fast. Uh, the key would be to look at where other communities uh, have wisdom. So if you're not super familiar with the scientific method, I think there's some really great tools there that most people in this community would benefit a lot from. I think some uh, basic statistics knowledge benefit a lot of people, and you see people making kind of better decisions. Uh, rationality and reading less wrong can be really beneficial if you didn't come from that sort of background. Around. So I think the real key is thinking about what areas you're not comfortable with. Maybe you've never done a literature review. Uh, your first book on a lot of these decision-making techniques will be very, very valuable. And are there any particular books that you recommend? Uh, I like so many books. Uh, most books really emphasize one model, so you're going to have to kind of read a bunch of them. I think that's wrong for rationality. I like how to lie with statistics to look at some biases that happen in sciences. I like how to measure anything to look at some application of measurement and evaluation techniques, especially in very tricky scenarios where most people might kind of throw up their hands and say it's impossible. Uh, so yeah, there's a whole collection. We actually have a reading list on our website that has a lot of these decision-making books. Oh, fantastic. So where do people go for that? Yeah, so charity entrepreneurship, uh, you go to our blog and then there's a reading list there. And another thing that we're doing is a big part of our focus when teaching entrepreneurs is teaching uh, decision making. So we're actually going to put up part of our entrepreneurship course online for free for anyone to access. And that will be the kind of decision making part and specifically in reference to how to make decisions about early stage organizations, but it will also be kind of the meta techniques that'll be useful across the board. Oh, fantastic. I think people will find that really useful. And the fact that you're sharing that online for everyone to use is excellent. And um, I'm going to move on to a, a trickier question now. Um, how could this translate into decision making on a societal level? So could it contribute to new, more intelligent democratic processes? <laughs> yeah, so uh, conceivably, this would be really great. You know, I think uh, generally, political parties would be a little bit less partisan if they looked at things from a lot of different angles instead of uh, kind of the, the angle that tends to be the, the default one they go for uh, and that sort of thing. In terms of implementation and pragmatically, how do you teach this? I think it's pretty challenging uh, to get happening on an institutional level. When you're in a large scale institution and you're trying to bring better decision making perspectives, I think bringing it slowly, describing it as adding a perspective instead of kind of uh, refuting or taking away a perspective, people generally are more susceptible to adding a methodology. Uh, but it's a, it's a big challenge. I think realistically, uh, you know, smaller institutions are going to have an easier time uh, using a wide range of, of heuristics and, and institutions in general that are kind of research focused or, or focused on decision making are, are going to have a huge advantage here. And, and do you have any advice for people who are particularly interested in improving institutional decision making and where they could go to read more or, or volunteer or potentially career options? Yeah, well, if you're, um, if you're thinking about influencing institutional stuff, uh, same kind of methodology when you think about the EA community. You want to think about what kind of uh, decision-making tools are not used very often in that institution, but would be very helpful. So maybe many of us as EAs would say, okay, like counterfactual thinking, what would have happened otherwise? That's a very useful tool. And maybe it's not used by a lot of big institutions when it comes to kind of funding different projects or, or that sort of thing. So you want to get a tool that's not used, try to bring it to an institution. Definitely your social skills games need to, need to be on point. You need to be very, very good socially and very strong at communicating this sort of thing. Uh, and then try to integrate it. And I would recommend uh, start small. So start with your department, start with the, the immediate colleagues, if you can kind of convince those people that it's high impact, then you can kind of spread it out from there. I think it will be pretty challenging to, to start at the top of a very large institution and get it implemented unless you're also in that position. I, I wonder, do you have any examples of anyone you know that's kind of been able to do that in an organization and bring in a, a new way of decision making that's really changed the way that they've worked as an organization? 
Yeah, so I think some metrics examples are, are good examples of this. So the introduction of like the DALI in the health community was just huge and really important and really added a bunch of quantified thing. Uh, the randomista movement uh, in the, the global poverty space as well is another good example. They really brought in some of the kind of top line methodology from, from science and applied it to global development where it wasn't uh, very common. And I think there's lots of room to do that sort of thing. If you look at the animal movement, there's lots of room to bring scientific methodology the same way that it came to the global poverty movement uh, and that sort of thing. So it definitely has happened in the past, but often it's a, uh, a large funder that's driving this or a large organization, and, and it's kind of a, a big a big part of what they do. So J-PAL, in the case of the randomista movement, for example, uh, had a huge role in this. Fantastic. Thank you. So I'm now going to move on to a question from Alan, who wants to know, what is your number one heuristic for decision making? Oh boy. Well, my, my number one heuristic is don't use a single heuristic. Uh, is that, <laughs> is that cheating the question? Uh, <laughs> no, I think that counts. <laughs> there, there's, there's a lot I like. I like counterfactual thinking. I like time capping a specific area. Uh, I like evaluating things numerically and transparently and showing it to someone else. Um, yeah. Yeah, that seems good. And similarly, like how should someone approach a decision that's particularly big or important, but feels very hard to break down? Yeah, well, often the most important decisions are, are really hard to break down, are really big and important. Uh, cross some cross-applicable heuristics that you could use in this scenario. Uh, find someone else who's broken down a similar decision or who you think is really good at breaking down decisions in general. So often people who are managerial roles or, or high-up roles will have to get really good at breaking down these big tasks into kind of more bite-sized chunks. So that's very, very beneficial. Uh, Again, so looking at it from multiple angles. So it might be very challenging to break down from one perspective. Say you're looking at something like a career choice. Uh, this might be impossible, just kind of like rationally thinking through all the variables. But maybe you can take a completely different perspective. Maybe you can go, okay, well, what if I just look at like job satisfaction and I see what jobs are at the top and then I start looking at that? Or what if I just look at the top careers from an impact perspective, like the top that uh, are recommended by ADK or charity entrepreneurship or that sort of thing, and then evaluate from there. So I guess uh, you want to think about it as like a three-dimensional object that you can turn around in your brain and kind of look at from different angles. And some angles, you'll just be able to make a lot more traction than others. Yeah, that seems like really good advice. And talking of advice, um, very good question from Mary Len. Um, so you talked about how kind of as you get older and you have more experience, you develop expertise. And so although like your table is getting smaller, like the tools on that table are more effective. And so Mary Len asks, like, should the EA movement listen more to the wisdom of older people? And what could we do to take on that wisdom? Yeah, I mean, I think one of the, the messages I want people to take away from this talk is to look a little bit outside the EA movement for refined intelligent techniques that other groups are, are using. Uh, and that's not to say that EA doesn't bring this kind of set of tools which are super useful and not used enough in the world. That's definitely true. Uh, but it is ultimately only one of set of tools. So that there's a lot to be learned outside of that. And I do think that when you're looking at mentors or advisors or this sort of thing, often someone having a whole bunch of experience in something quite different to what you have experience in, uh, the benefit that you're gaining from that is this kind of different way of looking at the world, this different set of tools, this different set of heuristics that they're going to use by default. Uh, so yeah, I think older people on average uh, do have more of these tools uh, kind of practiced and at their disposal. Not to say every old person has a million tools and every young person has none, uh, but there's certainly a tendency uh, to acquire different ways. And, and often people get a more nuanced view. You know, you hear often that people move to kind of shades of gray as they get older. And I think part of that is, is acquiring these tools and seeing lots of different angles on the same issue. Yeah, and I, I know that 80,000 Hours have had this series of careers advice from anonymous people um, passing on kind of their experience from their careers. And there's a whole series covering a load of topics. So if you're interested in that, I recommend checking that out on their website. And um, so another good question from Alan, which is what's the most systematic error that people tend to make in decision making? <laughs> hmm. Uh, so other than using not enough tools, I'll, I'll kind of bar that one because I've already said it. Uh, I think probably having too much uh, confidence in very unrobust calculations. Uh, so kind of numerical, hard cost effectiveness uh, estimates are really useful as a tool. They're really useful as an approach. Uh, but especially ones that are quite volatile, quite sensitive, uh, people really underestimate how easy it is to be like 10 orders of magnitude off. Uh, it's, it's really... Uh, 
you can't just say discount it by 90% and call your calculation robust. If you look at some of the really advanced CEAs and kind of how much variation even say a give all cost analysis goes through over the course of a year, it's uh, surprisingly significant. So the kind of credence that I would put on say back of the envelope, uh, really quick CEAs, uh, they, they tend to change a lot. So maybe that's uh, in the EA movement, something that I, I think can go wrong is people over relying on purely numerical approaches uh, when there's a really low evidence base. Yeah, yeah, I'd agree with that. And Jeffrey has a good question, which is when is it best to use a heuristic and when should you do more careful thought and how do you decide between those two approaches? Yeah, well, it goes it goes back to this time capping idea that I, that I referenced a little bit earlier. Uh, if it's a really important decision, you might explicitly decide, OK, I'm going to try to look at this from five perspectives. I'm going to try to talk to 10 different people who are intelligent on this. Uh, if it's a fairly trivial decision, you want to set a pretty tight time cap and maybe you bust your butt in that 30 minutes, uh, but then that's the most you can do. And then you kind of come to that evaluative decision. So the bigger the decision, the more important the decision, the more cross affecting the decision is, the more time you want to dedicate to it. Uh, that being said, I also think it's worth setting up specific plan reevaluation points because when it comes to something like a career decision or a charity uh, entrepreneurship decision, uh, you're not going to be able to just kind of make one call and then ride that for the next 60 years. Even if you spent, say, five years up front analyzing all the variables, uh, you will have to update uh, you know, every six months, every two years, that sort of thing, and kind of uh, decreasing frequencies as you get more and more confident in the view. Uh, but yeah, upfront time, more worth it. I think that uh, a lot of the time you start to hit diminishing returns in certain areas, and then either you have to kind of move to a different uh, cluster, a different set of heuristics, see if you can start getting stuff there, uh, or you might just realize, okay, I just need to try this out, see if it works, and then reevaluate after six months. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. So do you think that studying maybe certain academic disciplines, such as philosophy or economics, makes for better decision making? Well, it certainly leads to different tool usage. Um, if you tell me what major someone had, uh, you'll often suggest what tools they're going to reach for first. So a philosopher is going to reach for a different tool set uh, than a statistician. And uh, a person who studied uh, data science is going to reach for a different tool set than someone who studied physics. Uh, so I think that's actually something to be aware of, uh, that your major, especially if it's a more analytical major, will give you this uh, set of useful tools, and, and that's great. Uh, but if you've been trained in, say, economics, uh, you're going to reach that very naturally, very comfortably. And there's probably other perspectives that you want to look at uh, equally aggressively. Uh, maybe you haven't gone through them, maybe you've been naturally drawn to, to your given subject area because those are the tools that kind of seemed intuitively strong. Uh, but I, I actually think there's a danger where most people rely probably too heavily on the, the skill sets that were given in their major. Yeah, I, I agree with that. So Nathan wants to know, how do you track the impact of different tools? Is, it, is this something you can do in a quite straightforward way? Is there a website or tool that can help you to kind of aggregate your tracking? Yeah, it's, it's really tough. So I can tell you uh, one way that we're doing this with charity entrepreneurship with our research is we had a couple different ways of, of doing research, a couple different ways and perspectives of doing research. And we wanted to analyze uh, how predictive each of these ways were. So what we did is kind of isolated reports. Uh, for example, we'd look at an intervention uh, purely from an expert's perspective, kind of talk to 10 experts, get conversation notes, really get their overall perspective. And then we'd spend that same amount of time, say 20 hours uh, on a cost effective analysis and see what that looked like. And then spend 20 hours on a different methodology. And and then what we're going to kind of do is correlate these methodologies with the endline charities that get recommended and how well they do. So eventually, maybe we find out that experts are very good at predicting this, but not very good at predicting that and, and these subtle different elements. So that's like a very formal way is you kind of kind of look at uh, your decisions uh, and kind of allocate them specific amounts of time and then see how good that decision came out, especially if you're making a similar decision multiple times, like career changes or, or this sort of thing. Uh, but that's also like pretty tough. Like we get the unique advantage of being able to start a lot of charities a year. So we're able to kind of pull significant amounts of data from this. Uh, on a more individualized way in terms of uh, tracking your decisions, I mean, if you can uh, dedicate certain amount of time, certain approaches, and then try to give even just like a score out of 10 for the outcome of your decision, that will start to give you some sort of uh, correlative data on whether this uh, decision heuristic you seem to be good at or bad at, uh, and especially if you can get an external evaluation of whether that decision is good. If you work on betting markets or prediction markets or something like this that has very numerical feedback, uh, that's another great way to, to get a sense really quickly of if you're uh, using heuristics that are kind of leading you astray uh, or if you're making more accurate predictions. And most of the time, you'll be more more astray than you would expect. That's great advice. Thanks, Joey. So Lorenzo asks, what sort of activities could local EA groups run to improve decision making? Yeah, uh, so I think that 
when you encounter a challenging problem, so for instance, a lot of local groups do some research challenges, you know, they'll, they'll try to research a certain intervention from, from one angle or another angle. Uh, if you try to kind of split that up into very different approaches, so maybe you are trying to research an intervention, you want to see whether it's effective. Uh, one approach might be talking to experts and really get someone to focus on that aspect of it and come to a report. And another aspect, a different approach might be creating a CEA or cost effectiveness model. Uh, that can be really beneficial. And then maybe a third approach is using some sort of weighted model where you're looking at neglected distractibility and kind of the, the traditional things that EAs might model. Um, I think if you kind of look at very different perspectives and even really explicitly go deeply into those different perspectives and then rotate the next time. So say the second intervention, the person that did cost analysis moves to experts and that sort of thing. You'll start to get more familiarity with these different methodologies and more of a sense of the strengths and weaknesses. Uh, I think if you did that, you'll very quickly get a sense of, oh, wow, CEAs can be off a lot or, oh, hey, experts are really good at uh, details, but they're not that good at evaluative analysis because they don't think that way very often. Uh, these sort of... Uh, meta lessons uh, will be really applicable when it comes to anything, even if it's not researching that specific intervention in the future. You know, a lot of experts uh, share similar uh, weaknesses and strengths. A lot of CPAs uh, share similar weaknesses and strengths. Uh, we actually have our four methodologies written up in quite a bit of detail on our website. So you can also check that out if you kind of wanted like, how do I talk to experts? What's what's a kind of analytical way or a systematic way of approaching talking to experts to, to see what the output would be? Uh, we have that written up. It's like a 25 page document or something like this, quite extensive. Oh, brilliant. So people should definitely go and check that out after the session. Um, so I was wondering now if you could kind of talk us through an example of like a concrete decision that you made and then kind of the different tools that you applied and um, to give people a sense of like how they might go through this process. Sure. So uh, let's say we're looking at a cause area that charity entrepreneurship can focus on. Uh, we might try to look at this from a bunch of different angles because we're not, uh, it's a big decision, it's important for the organization, and it's not uh, sufficiently robust to make a decision from one angle. So on the one hand, maybe we'll make a cost effectiveness model for this, uh, determine kind of, do we think certain causes are more impactful? But then on the other hand, we'll talk to a bunch of experts to find out, hey, is there a space for charity entrepreneurship specifically? Or what is the timing? So that's another uh, heuristic that I think is very important to look at. Is now a particularly good time to start a charity in this area or that area? For instance, uh, due to COVID, uh, doing charities that are kind of related to government interventions are, is very challenging. It's a really difficult time to start a government policy charity relative to maybe what it would have been 24 months ago or 12 months ago. Um, so kind of looking at it from the timing angle and then uh, talking to kind of uh, other experts who are more execution experts. So logistically, does this seem possible for the, the kind of demographic that you're attracting? So in our case, if we're attracting EAs to our program, uh, is it logistically feasible for an EA to kind of come in and make a big difference in this? Uh, looking at it from a historical perspective. So if you're looking at other interventions in a similar area or that run similar execution, uh, similar types of uh, nonprofits. Uh, are they really cost effective? Is it a really impactful thing to do? Uh, and kind of analyzing these perspectives together, we often even color code it in like a, a spreadsheet or a table so that you can really easily see what perspective something does particularly well on, what perspective something does particularly poorly on. And if you have multiple options that you're considering, so say we were considering 10 different cause areas, we could very quickly see, oh yes, uh, this is the one that's scoring well on quite a few perspectives where we're getting some convergence on this one. And this other area maybe scores brilliantly on one area, but really poorly on another area. We should either look into that more carefully uh, or, or, or discard it. Yeah, no, that's really helpful. Thanks for talking through that. Um, so I think we've got time just for maybe one more question, which is, um, what is the role of emotion um, in decision making? And like, how much weight should you put on your kind of system one reactions compared to your system two critical thinking? Sure. So I've heard it argued uh, that emotion is like a fuel and shouldn't be used in decision making at all. It should just kind of be that the motivation. And I have some sympathy to that perspective. Uh, but I think it does depend on how your emotion uh, gets calibrated. Uh, so for example, say you're speaking to an expert who's been working in a field for a really long time, and they uh, feel like something's really like morally repugnant. Uh, they're probably getting at some sort of Chesterton span, some sort of important information. Sometimes people can't describe uh, what the reasoning or, or what the cluster they're using is very accurately, uh, but it's still very important. So I would say maybe if your emotions go against something or someone's emotions go against something, that should be a flag to kind of try to look deeper into it and understand what the basis is. And sometimes the basis will be something really important that you'll be, uh, you wouldn't have wanted to miss out. Uh, other times, I do think your emotions uh, can just lead you astray. So something's really weird or something's really unintuitive, uh, your emotions might just be wrong. Your emotions aren't very good at dealing with scale. So that that's a consistent issue. Um, but I do think that it can be, yeah, it can be a, a, an indicator of an area that you should put a little bit more care and caution uh, into looking into. Brilliant. So thanks very much, Joey. So that concludes the Q&A part of this session, but we don't want you to go away just yet. 
because discussing these ideas with other people can be a really good way to help you understand them. So we're going to use the last 20 minutes of the session for a, a couple of short speed meetings with other attendees. So if you check the session description below this video, you'll see a link for an icebreaker session where we're going to be gathering for those meetings. So please click on that link now and a new host will meet you on the other side. And thanks very much for watching.